Okay, well, it's 11.15 and a bit, so uh, we'll get started, shall we? Um, so this session is called uh, Developing Enterprise Blockchain Applications with Hyperledger Fabric. Um, my name is Andrew Coleman, so I work for IBM, and I've been working on Hyperledger projects for the last five years or so, uh, notably um, Hyperledger Composer in the early days, and, uh, and now Hyperledger Fabric. Uh, which I'm currently a maintainer. Um, so this session is very much developer-focused. It is literally teaching you how to write client applications uh, for the latest version of, of Fabric, which is version 2.4. Um, just out of interest, uh, uh, are you familiar with Fabric? Are any of you currently Fabric developers? Yeah? And are you familiar with the new programming model that came in in version 1.4? Yeah, good. That's good. That's fine. So this is going to make no assumptions that you're familiar with that. But um, if you are, then what I'm going to do is highlight the, the differences, uh, the simplifications and improvements that we've made in the latest version in 2.4. Um, and really, it's all around you know, the, the client applications that I'm not really going to talk much about developing smart contracts. Um, but, you know, as a client application developer, you're going to be interested in submitting transactions, invoking the smart contracts that are on the ledger. Um, and then we'll, you know, we'll talk about the basics and we'll go on to some, some more advanced stuff. And I'm going to pepper this presentation with, with, with snippets of code. Um, in the various languages that we support, and I don't favour any one over, and over the other, they're all equally capable. So to start off, um, you probably all know this, what is Hyperledger Fabric? It's, um, it's one of the older Hyperledger uh, blockchain projects. Um, it's been around since, well, 2016 was the first release, and it's had a lot of contributors from a lot of organisations. Um, it was very much designed as a, as a modular framework for building uh, blockchain applications. Um, uh, it, it implements this execute order validate model, um, which was unique to Fabric. Um, and that's very much reflected in how you submit transactions. Um, it has pluggable consensus protocols. So, you know, the, the ordering node can, has evolved over the years. It, the, currently, the default is raft-based orderer, um, which is crash fault tolerant. Um, but we are actually actively working now on a Byzantine fault tolerant uh, ordering service. Um, and, and we plan to deliver that in version 3. Um, now, notably, smart contracts can be authored in a, in a general purpose programming language. And we support three out of the box, but um, you know it, it's extendable. You can implement your own if you uh, if you feel the desire, um, rather than to have um, you know a, a language like Solidity or something prescribed for you that's that, that's written per, you know intentionally for smart contracts. So that that widens its appeal to um, to general purpose programmers. Um, it's a permission blockchain, so the participants are known to each other. Um, and that, um, you know, that has a bearing on the, the, the consensus protocols that we use. Um, we don't have to have proof of work and things like that. Um, and it was designed from the outset to support a, a broad range of, of industry use cases in the, you know, finance, insurance. You know, we've been hearing in the keynotes this morning a, a variety of industries that uh, are successfully put in uh, fabric into production. So what I'm going to do now is sort of start focusing on, um, on, on the topic of this talk. Um, and I just want to give you a, a picture of, um, of one component of Fabric, which is the peer. Now, the peer and you know, a blockchain network will run multiple peers across multiple organizations. Um, but inside the peer is the ledger itself. And the, and the ledger is made of, of two components. There's the, there's the blockchain, which is the you know, the, the ordered set of transactions, uh, where the transaction, you know, marks where, uh, say, you know, if you look at your bank account, you've got lines saying, well, something was paid in, something was paid out. They're the transactions. And then you've got the run in total, the current, what we call the world state, which is if, if you run all of those through this database, you end up with this world state, like your current bank balance. 
And so all valid transactions will affect that world site when it's finally committed to the ledger. Um, now, hosted by the peer, although in a separate process, is a smart contract. So all transactions are encoded into the smart contract. So when a client's application invokes a transaction, submits or evaluates a transaction, it runs the smart contract in this uh, chain code container. We call it chain code in Fabric. And that will interact with the ledger. And it can also emit events. So you can have um, contract events. And also when blocks are committed, um, you get these block events. Now, at the top there are the, are the blockchain developers, us. Okay. And I, I've, I split it into two because we've got developers who focus on smart contracts and we've got developers that focus on the client application. And I don't believe that they are necessarily the same person. So, you know, the, the, the developer that develops a smart contract will have deep knowledge of how that works. The developer who develops the client application is probably also developing, you know, interacting with other systems, database system, messaging middleware, integration, as we heard earlier. The, these blockchain developers are not just focusing on blockchain. There's a whole raft of other things they have to worry about in their day job. And so probably the skill sets of, of these two developers are different. So certainly the, the client application developer will need to know what that does but not necessarily how it does it. Um, and that's very much driven uh, our design of the, of the programming model. Um, so for the purposes of this presentation, we are focusing on the developer of the client application. So many of you raised your hands when you said you were, you were already developing um, client applications using the the new programming model, as we called it back in 1.4 when we first developed it. So we, we set out to create um, a set of, of high-level APIs that expose the more sort of business-type abstractions, the, the sort of things that the typical client um, application developer would be doing. Um, and as I say, we first delivered that into, into Fabric 1.4, and we built it as a as a higher layer of abstraction on all of the existing SDK software development kits. So up until that point, that the SDKs were very low level uh, in order to submit a transaction. And, and don't worry about this because we've built the high level application so you, um, um, programming model, so you don't have to worry about this. But you know, back in the old days, you have to use to write hundreds of lines of code just to submit a transaction onto the ledger. Um, and so we, we, we felt the need to um, um, raise the layer of abstra abstraction on that. Um, and we also um, were very careful with the naming of the, um, of, the, of the classes and the methods in the new programming model. We wanted to speak the language of the target audience, the people that were familiar with networks and, and contracts and transactions, rather than, you know, fabric terms like, um, you know, chain code and channels and things like that, although we've kind of mixed and matched a little bit. Um, and we came up with it with the idea um, of, the, of the gateway, which was very much a sort of a, a virtual object used in, the, in this um, programming model. And, and uh, we built that in all of the three languages that we supported, Node, JavaScript, TypeScript, Java, and Go. So um, towards the end of last year, we developed, we, um, we released Fabric version 2.4. Um, and one of the no major new components in 2.4 was uh, with the gateway. So the gateway is um, an implementation of this high level programming model, but it's now in the peer itself rather than as a layer in the, in the, uh, in the SDK. Um, and so we, we now expose that as a, as, a, as a service from the peer. And so we went back and we rewrote the, the three S SDKs, the client APIs, into these lighter weight ones, which are easier to use, much lighter weight uh, dependencies, and selfishly, they're much easier to, to maintain as well. Um, and so 
when this finally gets into a, an LTS release, version 2.5, we do actually plan to, to start deprecating the older SDKs. Um, and, you know, we, we've built up a fair bit of experience now of usage of the programming model. Um, and in certain aspects, we've made it simpler to use. Um, and at the same time, we've also enhanced some of its capabilities, so made it slightly more flexible based on, on patterns of usage that we were seeing and, and, and were being asked for. Uh, so for things like, um, you know, asynchronous submission and, and support for offline, and offline signing and things like that. Um, and one of the benefits now of the, of the gateway being in the peer itself is that the client application only needs to make one single gRPC connection into that peer, the gateway peer, the, the chosen peer, a peer that you trust, okay, to, 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 to run this life cycle, transaction life cycle on your behalf. Um, and then the peer itself will um, make connections to all of the other peers in the network um, and also all of the ordering service on your behalf. So you only have to now make um, uh, one connection. And a consequence of that is that you no longer need these, these um, network config files or CCP files, depending on the SDK that you used. It was called different things, but it was, a, it was basically this YAML file format that defined all of the endpoints that you might want to connect to. Um, and it also, also had other things like gRPC options, timeouts, and stuff like that. Um, but what we have actually done now is we say, actually, the client application can make that one single gRPC connection, um, supply that, and we no longer need that CCCP file. Um, commit strategies. Um, so that was something where, you know, what defines when a transaction is committed to the ledger? Um, they put out these block events, but how many block events do we listen to? Well, actually, with, by embedding the gateway in the peer, we've now um, automated all of that, and we actually have an ideal strategy that I'll explain to you later. So you don't have to um, worry about that either. Um, we've done away with wallets for storing identities. Um, these were all things that weren't really central to interacting with Fabric. Um, uh, and in fact, you know, you, Generally, um, developers who are uh, developing uh, the, these applications will have their own mechanisms for storing their uh, um, uh, private keys and things like that. Okay, so this isn't about smart contracts, but it's useful to know what a smart contract does and, and what it looks like. Um, and the important thing to note is that all transactions have to go through um, a smart contract. All interactions with the ledger have to go through a smart contract. Um, and this is really sort of the, the, the framework of what it looks like. You'll have a class. This is, uh, this is JavaScript. Um, you've got a class, extends contract, and then you've got methods. Now, each of those methods is a transaction function. So we've got, three, we've got four transactions, issue, transfer, redeem, uh, description. Okay, and so when you submit a transaction from your client application, you have to give it a name, that will be the name. And although we're not worrying about what code is in there, fundamentally, the code in here will be implementing the, the smart contract logic and it will be interacting with the ledger and it interacts with the ledger via these put states and get states. Okay, reads and write operations on the... On the you know, the world state. Um, and what that will do is we'll form a read-write set. So it's like a, um, a simulation. Um, we'll get on to what, what, what endorsement is um, a little bit later. So if you're already using the new programming model, you'll be familiar with this basic hierarchy of objects. At the top level, uh, we've got a gateway, which represents Know, in the old days, a virtual connection into the network. Now it's that gateway actually is in the peer. Um, and so you can then get a connection to each of the networks, and that's a, that's a channel in fabric terms. Um, and once you're targeting a channel, you can get an object representing um, a smart contract instance on that channel. 
And there, sort of the, the, at the highest level of abstraction, you can evaluate a transaction, which will invoke a transaction, a, a transaction function to do a, a read operation on the ledger, or submit transaction if you want to modify the ledger. And under the covers, they're doing very different things. And you can also hook into events. So your client application can listen to events, whether they're chain code events or block events as they're being emitted. So this is now the general structure of a, of a client application. Okay, we've got some work there to uh, specify our identity because you know it's a permission network. That's uh, the identity that um, uh, your transactions are done under. Um, you'll need some sort of signer implementation, a function that signs the proposals and the, um, the transactions. Um, so that's a function that just takes um, a digest and returns a signature. Um, and then you'll make your gRPC connection into your favorite peer. And given that, you'll then create a gateway instance using these three things, um, access your network, your contract, and then you can start submitting transactions. So we've got two transaction submissions, one after another. And then when your uh, application ends, there's some, there's some cleanup code. That's, that's the general structure of a very simplified um, application. And uh, you know, that's taken from real code, barring some imports. This is Java. Um, you know, barring some imports at the top, that will work. By the way, do feel free to ask questions as we go along, as long as they're relevant to this. Yeah, so these slides are all uploaded onto the okay. onto the, the website. Yeah. Can submission of transactions still wait for the commit? Yes. Yeah, so um, we'll we'll come on to that. The question was, does the submission of um, uh, transactions wait for the commit? Yes, it does. But if you don't want to, then we can support that as well. So we'll, we'll come on to that. So yes. Yeah. So, so you, you must make sure that the, the, the peer you're connecting to is already on the channel that you want to interact with, uh, or if any peer. Yeah. No. So what what um so so the question was the peer that you connect to does it have to be a member of the channel that you want to transact on, um, and the answer is not necessarily because the gateway service itself will um, when it comes to. We'll come on to this in more detail. So let's start with a quick answer, which is no, and then I'll explain why later. <laughs> yeah. All right, so we support three languages. Um, so we have three uh, client a APIs, SDKs, um, then you, um, because these, uh, these, these are now the lighter weight ones that replace the older ones. Um, and they all do support the same thing, but they, look different, they do it in different ways. And the reason is we've really tried to, you know, adopt the, the idioms, the patterns that are meaningful to that particular language. So, so for example, in Java, we, we've adopted this sort of fluent style uh, builder pattern. So, you know, you can chain your functions together. Um, obviously, Java supports exception handling. So, you know, you surround it with a big try catch block. Um, and that, that, you know, that makes, uh, makes for a, a Java st uh, style. Um, with, with Node, um, TypeScript or JavaScript, um, then you, you typically pass you know, JavaScript objects, JSON-like objects, to, to pass in your, your options. Um, and with Go, we, we've adopted this, uh, this idea of uh, optional function, functional arguments, which is, um, which is very popular in, in, in Go APIs. But they all do the same thing. Um, so let's step through each, each uh, part of the process. So we've got to connect to the gateway. Um, and a gateway object represents um, the connection to the, the, the fabric network with a given identity. So you know, if you want to interact with the network using two or more identities, then you can have two or more gateways. Um, all we ask is that you share the same gRPC connection. I'll, I'll tell you why in a minute. Um, 
And so to create a gateway, you need a gRPC connection. Um, you need your client identity, and you need a signing implementation. Um, so, you know, I, as I say, I'm going to give snippets of code in, in random languages as we go along, just to uh, not show any favoritism. Um, obviously, when you're dealing with Go, um, you'd want to check the error um, as it comes back and do error handling. Um, you know, as you go along in the code, in, in Node or Java, you would, uh, you would use exception handling mechanisms. So that's creating your gateway object. Um, and to, before you do that, you need a gRPC connection. Now, we've got out of the business of making those gRPC connections on your behalf. Um, you only need one now, rather than one to each peer you're um, connecting to. And actually, each language has a perfectly capable gRPC uh, library itself. Uh, and so rather than you know, us sort of wrapper that, and then you know, every time a new option or something different is required, you, know, you come to us and say, oh, well, can, can you support this? And then we, you know, we used to have to um, add that support in there and um, make sure that we then extended the CCP file uh, format to support that and things like that. And we, it just, you know, it, it, it's not necessary. Um, so you would use a gRPC lang um, library of your um, chosen language, and then you would pass that into the, the gateway when you've got it. Um, and very similar um, with identity and signing. Um, you know, rather than you know, with the old APIs, we said, well, give us your private key and trust us, we, we, you know, we won't do anything nasty with it. it we'll, we'll, we'll just use it for signing. What you now actually do is you provide a function that does signing, um, and we will invoke it at times when the transaction needs to be signed. Um, now, if you have a, a private key, then we provide a helper function uh, to create a, a signing function for you. Um, but you know, be reassured that your private key never goes across to the gateway. It always stays in your client application. It always did. Um, but you know this this API emphasizes the fact that it, you know no keys get passed across the network into the server. Um, so we always call back again into your client application when we need anything signed. Right. So we'll come on to submitting transactions. So. Any transaction that modifies the ledger has to go through a process uh, of endorsement. And depending on the endorsement policy, which is associated with the smart contract that you're invoking, this um, transaction might need to be uh, invoked or, or simulated on, on multiple peers across multiple organizations. Uh, and you know, as we, we saw that smart contract uh, that was uh, installed on, on a peer, we saw that it gets invoked, and I said that it, it generates a read-write set. It doesn't modify the ledger at that point. What it does is it runs against that peer's copy of the ledger, uh, and, it, and the read-write set represents what it would do to its ledger. Okay, so it, that, that's, that's an endorsement. The peer then signs it and sends it back to the requester. Um, so to, to um, submit a transaction, you've got to go off to various peers and gather all the endorsements, and they must all agree, okay? Both the read and the write sets have to agree across all of them. And when they do, you gather those together, it gets signed again on the client side, um, and then it gets sent off to the ordering service, okay? And then that, that orders the transactions using its consensus mechanism, and it broadcasts it out to the, to the network and um, commits it. Um, and that's quite a complex bunch of stuff, and that all gets done in one function called submit transaction. So just to step through that, um, in a diagram, yep, we've got our client called submit transaction. Okay, one gRPC connection into the whole network. Okay, we've decided that this is our gateway peer. Um, so what that then does on your behalf is it gathers the endorsements from itself 
and from any other organisation that's required in order to satisfy the endorsement policy. And then, once it's gathered all of that, it will send it to the ordering service. And the ordering service will batch up transactions, order them, and broadcast them to, the, um, to every peer, okay, for committing to the ledger. And then only at that point do they emit a block uh, event and the gateway will return control from that submit transaction. So query in the ledger, doing a read from the ledger. So just to emphasize that all interactions with the ledger are done through the smart contract. So if you don't have any transaction functions that read from the ledger and return values, then you can't query the ledger. It has to be done through the smart contract. It still has to be invoked. But if you're not modifying the ledger, it doesn't have to go through this um, uh, endorsement uh, and ordering uh, process. You can simply just invoke one peer, and typically it will be the gateway peer or a peer within the gateway's organization um, in order to run that transaction function and return to the user whatever was returned from that smart contract function. And we use the evaluate transaction function for this. And so the, 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 the gateway peer will always try and choose um, a peer of the highest block height in order to assure, assure you you're getting the most up-to-date value. Um, and it's actually using this mechanism that we've, we've been able to do away with the need for um, these commit strategies. Because when you go to the gateway, um, the, the commit strategies were always about, well, I've submitted a transaction. When I follow it with an evaluate transaction query, how do I know I've got the most up-to-date value? And you, know, you, you used to wait on these various commit events to, before you were sure that you, know, you, you got that. But now, the gateway's managing that all for you. So it knows after it's submitted the transaction, it should look when it's doing a query for the highest block um, before it returns a, um, a, a result to you. So slightly more advanced um, when we're dealing with, with private data. So private data collections are used to store sensitive data and it's stored off chain. Uh, only the hash of that data gets written into the, into the shared ledger. Um, now, the usual pattern uh, for an application is that it, um, when it's dealing with sensitive data, it sends it using the transient data field in the proposal. Um, and again, that doesn't end up on the ledger. Um, and so the gateway is going to be aware of um, data that comes in the transient, and, it, and it's going to be more cautious in how it um, requests um, endorsements from other organizations because you know, it doesn't want to get into a state where it's, it's, it's sharing your sensitive data with other organizations unless it's pretty sure um, that it's OK. Um, and I'll explain in the next slide. Um, what the endorsement logic is, but um, you know, with, with, with transient data, it does take a more guarded approach, and because of that, you could result in the, the gateway not collecting enough endorsements to satisfy the various policies. Um, and so that's that's the one situation uh, that I can think of anywhere where where, where, you, where the, the the application developer would actually want to specify who the endorsing orgs should be. Um, and that's probably okay with, with, with um, private data because, you know, typically you're doing things like, well, I, you know, I, I want to sell my asset to that organization there. And you, you, you know who the buyer and the seller are, and it's a good chance that they will be the two orgs that need to endorse the transaction. So you also need to be aware that um, who you're using as your, as your gateway peer and I said at the beginning, that's your, your trusted peer. And if you're sending sensitive data across, then you, know, you really are trusting that peer um, to, 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 to handle that to, or to even see that private data. And if you're an organization that doesn't run a peer, then you'll need to send it to a peer that you, you do trust in another organization. So, a little word on, on endorsement because we, 
we put a lot of work into this. Um, so that each, each, Sorry. each, yes. Some question about private collections and block hiding. Yeah. Uh, so what we saw in fact that uh, there is a gossip involved when data is distributed uh, across peers for private collections. Yeah. So sometimes even if you have the highest block height, uh, the data from the private collection can be still not distributed. And is this somehow addressed in this new implementation? Because we, we had to, to provide we provide consistency, we uh, had to use a single instance of the peer each time instead of local and single different peers. Okay, so so there there was a there was a timing issue where the private data wasn't available. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so um, I mean this this does have a retry mechanism, which um, which I'll talk about towards the end, but. Um, I, yeah, I, I would I would need to look at that. I don't know, don't know if you've gone, Dave. I, I, yeah, I have an answer for that. So with the private data collections, you can configure how proactively that private data is sent to the other peers. And so that's what people would typically do is make it more proactive. So at endorsement time, it sprays the private data further. Uh, and then also at commit time, it'll try to retrieve the private data before it has it. So that's usually what we would tell people is to tweak those parameters the private data collection yeah. so that you don't get into that situation in the first place. Okay, thank you. Um, so each smart contract is deployed in an endorsement policy. Um, so for example, um, you know, that, 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 that top one is a majority, you've got three orgs, I need two of them, that's the default policy. Um, the second one is a bit more specific, it says, well actually I want org one to sign it, um, and then either org three or org four. Uh, so org one might be a, you know, an auditor or a, you know, a regulator, some, someone who absolutely has to sign every, every transaction. Um, but it gets more complicated when we're dealing with, with private data collections um, and multiple chain codes. So for example, um, you know, a transaction a proposal might have to satisfy multiple endorsement policies at the same time. So if we're doing chain code to chain code, if one chain code is deployed using that one and the other one is with the second one, actually both of those at the same time have to be satisfied. Um, and the only way to satisfy both of those at the same time is to have org one and org three sign it. Um, so we're now narrowing down, we're forming a, a sort of a, a derived endorsement policy that takes in, into account both of those. And it gets worse with, with private data collections because they have their own signature policies. Um, and so we need to bring those in as well. Um, and if you're doing a read from a, a private data collection, then you've got the ownership policy as well, which might you know, limit you to who, you know, whoever has copies of the private data collection. Um, and then it really gets worse with, with, with state-based endorsement policies because you know, each individual state within the, the metadata and the ledger can have an endorsement policy that's just, just for that state itself. And, that, and they can change, so a transaction can change those, so they're dynamic. So whenever you're submitting a transaction, all of those have to be satisfied. And so how does the gateway do that? So prior to 2.4, the client application had to understand all of the things that were being touched by the, 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 the smart contract. Okay? It, it really needed to understand how the smart contract worked rather than just what it did, it, it had to understand how it did it in order to be able to um, invoke the, you know, the, the right organizations to, to endorse. The gateway takes that all away from you. And the way it does it now is to, well, first of all, it simulates, it runs, it endorses on its uh, local peer, either the gateway peer or one of its local org peers. Um, and we've, um, we've, we've augmented the ledger with, um, it gathers info um, on which chain codes, which private data collections, which state-based endorsement policies get touched as a result of that transaction invocation on the gateway peer. Um, and when it's gathered all that information, it then works internally with the discovery service to say, well, okay, what, what, you know, what, what's the overall endorsement policy? Who else do I need to get to endorse that transaction? And so it will then uh, invoke those, uh, those other peers and gather the endorsements and got a pretty good chance that it's going to succeed. So a question. Is that a considerable performance overhead or is that just a um, 
So is there any performance overhead? No, I'd say the other way around. It's, you know, because we now know exactly who to target. We don't have to go off. A lot of applications, the way they used to handle this was just get everyone to endorse it because it, the problem was too difficult to solve. If you get everyone to endorse it, build up this huge transaction and pass it through and let the, like, let the final validation phase decide whether that worked or not. But now, you know, up front, we've got a pretty good idea of who needs to endorse that transaction proposal. Um, and a question. Yep. Is there a second simulation being done, uh, or it's just in one? So it's, uh, so, it, so it's two phases. First, it simulates it on, on the local peer in order to then understand what the endorsement policy will be. Okay. And then it's got a, you know, a set of endorsers that it needs. Obviously, it's already done it itself. So whatever's left, it will then, in parallel, go out and gather all the others. So it's, it's, a, it's a two step. So there's no. No second simulation. No, it's just, it just doesn't. It, yeah, it's just one simulation on each, each of the peers that needs to simulate. Yeah. Okay, so um, so we've talked about submit transaction. Um, and you know you just give it the, the transaction name and the arguments. But if we want to now start doing some, uh, you know, you know, give it some more options. Um, so for example, the um, you know passing transit data, uh, targeting specific organisations. If you you know for, for endorsement, if you if you if you need to do that, um, then there's another form which is submit and evaluate. Okay, so they're slightly lower level than the than the submit, um, and then there's Go and Node examples, okay, using functional arguments or, or a JavaScript object. Um, but that just allows you to, you know, slightly finer control. Um, or we can get even more control if we want to, well, okay, the submit transaction is, you know, it's, it's going out, um, it's getting multiple endorsements, uh, it's gathering the responses, um, you know, it's submitting to the order, it's a wait and a commit notification. Um, we can break that down now into individual things. So, so, so in Java, we're using the, you know, the, the star where you just chain, chain them together. So we can create a new proposal. Uh, we can put transient data in there and, and then we build and endorse. And, and before we submit, we can, you know, we can pick out intermediate results. We can get the transaction ID or the result. Um, and so, you know, and we can implement, you know, different flow logic. We might want to, you know, do some different retry options or something like that in between each step. So if, if you really want, you know, we, the, the high level one is great, but if, if you want finer control, you want to do your own logic in there, then, then we can break out these steps and you, you can have more control over them. So if a peer doesn't have the chain code uh, installed, the gateway, then the gateway will not try and get it to um, endorse a transaction. So, that, so, that, so the gateway peer, you know, the, the, the service discovery um, and the gateway are, are, are working very closely together. Yeah, yeah. So if there's a transaction proposal on 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 a channel, so to come back to your question earlier about channels, what if it's not in the channel? Well, that that's fine because it will in, work with the discovery service to, to to find a peer that is a member of that channel. Cross uh, organizations. Cross organizations, yeah, and the the same with chain code. Unless you're passing transient data, in which case it won't just go off to another organization willy nilly. Um, but yeah, apart from that, you know, you've got you've got a channel. Um, and a, a chain code ID, it will find the peers and the organizations that can run that and it will, it will ask them. Okay. Yep. Okay. All right, so um, some, some other logic, and this comes back to your question earlier about, well, does, does submit transaction wait for the commit? Yes, it does, but if you don't want to wait, for example, if you, if you want something a bit more responsive, if you're writing a, a REST application where you, know, you, want, you, you want to get a result back fairly quickly or you're updating a UI or something like that, then you don't want to sit there waiting for the, you know, the, the, the orderer to, to batch your transactions and to, and to validate and commit. Um, 
you'll still need to eventually before you know that transaction's been committed. But in the meantime, you can, you can do some other logic. Um, and so you can do a, an async submit, submit async. Um, in all in, and then it will return control to you um, as soon as it's successfully sent to the ordering service. Um, and it will return an object along with that, but you can then you know, invoke a wait. So you, uh, you can block to wait for the results eventually, yes? On the wait, is there any granularity in the server? Let's say I have a network of 10 tiers, yep. and I'm only having three of them endorsing. Yep. Can I have the granularity to say I'm interested only in the commit and the endorser? Yeah, so, so, the, so the commit will actually wait for the commit on the gateway itself. So it's only going to wait for that one, one commit. Oh, really? Yeah. Just that's it's right, because it, yeah, that's one, and it only needs to because if it's followed up by a query and evaluate transaction, that gateway knows it can find, <laughs> it knows it can find the peer that has that one because. The, the, the event of the commit means that only the commit on the peer on the gateway has, be, has been completed? Yes. Okay, yep. not all of them. Not all no, no, it's not gonna wait. It's not gonna wait for all of them. No, it's, it's only gonna wait for what it really needs to. Bear in mind, you know, it only needs to wait for that because if it's followed up by a query, it knows it can find the latest value. So, um, so you can handle uh, blockchain events yourself. Um, so you can uh, you can wait on block events. Uh, so you might have some application that uh, you know wants to. Um, receive the block events and do something like, you know, store data on a, you know, a, an off-chain database or something like that. Um, and you can wait on these um, chain code events or contract events, typically, you know, for invoking business logic or, you know, if, 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 whatever the chain code is sending out in its events, you can consume that. Um, we support, so in the, in the, in the older SDKs, we, uh, we had the idea of um, event playback and event checkpointing, so we, we've implemented that all as well. Uh, so we, we've, we've taken nothing away, we've, we've only added. Um, error handling, so, um, so the errors are, are you know, potentially coming back um, across your gRPC channel. And we very much adopted the um, uh, the gRPC best practices for error handling, and we, you know we support what it calls the um, the richer error model. Uh, so, so there's a link if you want to read about that. Um, and you know there's there's an error type, so there's a hierarchy of errors. Um, so um, you know we can indicate whereabouts in the transaction flow that error occurred, whether it was an endorsement or you know submitting to the order or something like that. Um, um, a gRPC error has a status code, and um, you know Google define a you know a well-defined set of of status codes, um, and each one has a different meaning. Um, uh, in as far as you know, should you try and retry? Is it a transient error, or is it more of a an application coding error and things like that? So we, we we've tried to you know keep all of our um, errors within uh, the, the the framework that it sets out there. So for example. You know, if the if the read write set mismatches, then that, that should be re you know retried because it's a transient issue. Um, but you know, if you've in, invoked a transaction with the wrong number of arguments, then that you know you've got to alter your, your application. There's no point in retrying. That's never it's never going to work. Um, and also, um, these gRPC errors have um, uh, extra details that can be added to them. Um, and what we've done is that. Um, you know, if any of the, when, when the gateway fans out to other peers and ordering nodes, if, if, they, if they return errors, gRPC errors, then what we do is we bundle them together under the, this details section. Um, and, it, and if you look at the, Mary, the, the error message you can, and, and, and dig down into the details, um, you know, you can see which, which peer, you know, actually threw the error and why. Um, so we've, we've got a lot more detail on the error messages there, and there's, there's just some snippets of code that show how you would um, dig down into the details. Um, so we've made a much better job of, um, you know, higher availability with, um, with this new gateway model. So for a start, um, um, high availability, so you, 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 you know, you, you're now in charge of managing your gRPC connection. And typically in a, in a cloud deployment, you'll go through a, a, um, 
you know, an ingress controller, a load balancer, okay? And that, you know, you've got, you've got a single connection endpoint for your client, and that will fan out um, to, to, to multiple gateways. By the way, every peer is a gateway peer, unless you turn it off. So by default, every peer can, can work as a gateway. Um, and you know, we can do that fairly easily because the, the gateway is stateless. You know, it, the, you know there's, no, there's no peer affinity that's needed as you're going through the, um, the, the process. Um, and there's, you know, there's a fair bit of retry logic that we've, uh, that we've put into the gateway as well. Um, all right, so we've, um, um, we've also done a lot of work on documentation. We've, we've rewritten the, um, um, you know, the developing applications section. Um, and so, and uh, you know, there's a large section on how the gateway works internally if you're interested in the internals. Um, and we've built a, a lot of uh, new samples. So we've got these asset transfer samples and there's quite a few of them. And we go from the, the really easy through to the, the really quite advanced. Uh, so we demonstrate all, you know, the private data and state-based endorsement. Um, so they're all in the, in the, in the fabric samples. Um, we've got, you know, the Java doc, JS doc, Go doc, API reference. Okay, so that's all uh, indexed from that URL there. Um, getting help, of course, where there's the, the fabric mailing list, Discord, if you want to have a conversation, and of course, Stack Overflow. Um, and if you find bugs, then by all means raise an issue on the on the Fabric Gateway repo. But that's 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 not for questions. That's for that's for bug reports. So just to summarise, you know, you know, this work on on the on the programming model started, you know, way back in in version 1.4, and this is the natural progression where we've you know we've put all of that logic into the peer itself, um, and. Uh, Really, I encourage you, if you're, if you're around Wednesday morning, to try this out because we've built a, a workshop that will take you from nothing through to deploying a, a, a fabric network on, uh, on Kubernetes and um, you know, building some client applications and, and, and running them. And uh, that, that will run Wednesday morning in the, the hotel next door, I believe. Um, so thank you. Any further questions? All right, thank you. Yeah. Um, so, 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 so the question is, what about um, calling the external uh, service off chain? So are we talking about from a client application or from a smart contract? Okay, right, that, that's a conversation over a beer tonight. Um, but this was more about client applications, but generally speaking, I would say that's a bad idea because you know that that external thing could change, and it won't have been endorsed by the the multiple endorsers that have to sign off a smart contract. Um, but we could, we can talk about that. All right. Thank you. <laughs>